Hi, welcome back to Zifari, the video novel. Um, today we're going to read all of chapter 10. It's not very long. So, if you're ready, uh, sit back, relax, and we'll get started. Here we go. Sergeant Earhart met Corporal Reed at the motor pool behind the Border Patrol station in the Witch at 7 a.m. The driver she had requested had the Jeep ready to go. Earhart and Reed put their briefcases with laptops, pens, and legal pads inside on the front passenger seat and rear bench seat respectively and walked over to the armory cage. Sergeant Earhart chose a Charter Arms Pitbull 9mm revolver with a shoulder holster and a sawed-off World War II-era Russian IZH-43A with a 14-inch barrel and a shortened stock worn on a holster she wore at her hip. Patrol armorer Marie Farrell made these up as a hobby in her free time. She provided two dozen officially to the patrol and was said to sell them under the table to troopers. The IZH-43A can shoot one or two, one or both rounds at the same time. Emily took along two magazines of number 12 rat shot. Reed chose a chrome 45 ACP Colt 1911 with two clips and an OWB waist holder. They walked back to the Jeep and got in. Sergeant Earhart told the driver, step on it. I want to be at Bell Plain at the shift change. He did, and they were. Sergeant Earhart had intended to spend 30 minutes at each platform. Well, Bell Plain, or the Plain as the group troopers called it, required a longer stay. Trooper Ann Dolan was just finishing his shift, and his replacement, Tobias, everybody called him Toby Slack, was just climbing the metal staircase when Sergeant Earhart arrived. Trooper Reed bounded up the stairs, and as Sergeant Earhart reached the platform, attempted to call the inspection to order with a stirring ten hut. Dolan looked around as though he'd been interrupted taking his shit, and Slack's mouth dropped open. Troopers, she began, from now on, I'll be conducting random inspections of all the platforms in the district. I'll be looking for good organization and attention to detail, cleanliness, and a demonstration of your marksmanship skills with all of your personal weapons and the weapons stored in your shed. My aide-de-camp, Trooper Reed, will begin the inspection. When he's finished with you, you can show me your skills. Trooper Reed spent 20 minutes with Dolan and Slack, going over every inch of the platform, from winch to shed to point. He took notes on paper rather than typing them into his laptop. When he was finished with the two, he marched them over to Sergeant Earhart. Trooper Slack at the flamethrower, and Earhart said as she walked to the point, toast that bush over there pointing to the tall purple lilac about 25 feet from the point. And Trooper Dolan, while Slack gets his weapon ready, grab a shotgun and come here. While Slack busied himself with the flamethrower, Dolan grabbed one of the scatter guns in the shed, loaded two shells into it, and walked over to the sergeant. Yes, ma'am, he said. Dolan was wearing a decidedly non-regulation Chicago Cubs baseball cap. Earhart hated the Cubs. She grabbed the cap off his head and threw it out into Zeland. Can you hit that, she asked him. Dolan said nothing in response, put the gun to his shoulder and promptly blew the blue cap to confetti. Nice shot, Dolan, she told him. Now go get your personal weapon. Slack walked over and fired up the flamethrower. He aimed at the lilac bush and pulled the trigger. A gout of flame spurted out of the weapon, and the top half of the lilac turned instantaneously into pleasantly scented torch. Now that's my kind of aromatherapy, Slack said. Sergeant Earhart smiled in spite of herself and told Slack, Grab one of your personal weapons. Let's see what else you can do. Then to Trooper Reed, she said, Get down to the Jeep and bring up the two bottles of water I brought along. Reed said, Yes, ma'am. It was back in less than a minute. By that time, Slack had returned with his Glock 20 and Dolan with a Smith & Wesson, Smith and Wesson M&P 1522, an AR-15-styled rifle that Earhart knew used, used economical but less powerful 22 LR cartridges. Let's see what you two can hit, Earhart said. Trooper Reed, toss a bottle out to the left's left. Slack, try to hit it. Reed underhanded the bottle out to the left, and just as the bottle hit the top of its arc, Slack put a round into the plastic. It exploded with a satisfying splash. Earhart was impressed. Nice, Slack, she said. Slack smiled and nodded. Thanks, ma'am, he replied. Okay, Dolan, your turn, she nodded to Reed to toss the second bottle. The bottle hit the ground about 30 feet from the wall. Dolan lackadaisically took his Glock from its holster, took aim, and put three bullets into the plastic bottle and the spot where the bottle had been in less than two seconds. No automatic for Dolan. He wanted to hit what he aimed at. Thank you, gentlemen, Sergeant Earhart said. When Trooper Reed and I finish our inspection reports, we'll meet with you to discuss your performance. And she walked down the stairs to the Jeep, Trooper Reed following behind her. As the Jeep drove out of sight to the north, Dolan went to the shed, 
picked up one of the always charging patrol cell phones and dialed a number he found on a list taped to the wall inside the shed. Earhart and her puppy were just here for a surprise inspection. They just left and I think that they're headed your way. Good luck. A few minutes later, there was a ringing from inside the storage shed. B.B. opened the door to the shed and found one of the patrol cell phones ringing. He picked it up and said, Duvalier, and listened. Then he hit the end button and dialed the number for the next platform to the north on the patrol phone tree, Toll Road. He spoke into the phone. This is Duvalier at 119th. You just got a call from the casino. Earhart is on her way from a, for an inspection. Yes, no, you bet. After he alerted Toll Road, he put the patrol phone away in its charger. He pulled out his own phone and called Ike. The Donaldson brothers were set to return for another chance at a zombie at 10 a.m. Ike had left at 8, and as soon as B.B. got to the platform this morning, to run an errand telling B.B. he would return at 9. Ike answered on the first ring, thank God, and B.B. told him about the surprise inspections. Ike promised B.B. that he would stop the Donaldsons. They were so hungry for zombies that they would come whenever Ike told them to. Now that his ass was temporarily out of the fire, B.B. got a bucket and a bottle of bleach from the storage shed and cleaned the platform. After that, he straightened all the stuff in the shed and wiped down the toilet and shower. Then he put the binoculars around his neck and walked to the point of the platform and swept the field until he heard a jeep roll up at the base of the wall behind him. Willie was still sedated and healing, and McDougal began to think that he may have gone in the wrong direction. He continued to read all the scientific studies that he could find, and he added obscure religious texts to his list of sources. He discovered that a number of cultures believed in the duality of souls. The Inuit believed that two and sometimes more souls inhabited a human body. Traditional Chinese culture had held that there is a soul that leaves a body after death and another that stays with the corpse. Some Taoists believe that there are up to ten souls in a body. Hungarians and Finns and some other Northern European peoples have believed in shadow souls. The Estonians have an even more complicated understanding of the soul, McDougall discovered. McDougall found that zombies have been part of folklore throughout the world. He learned that thanks to movies and television, most people associated the undead with Haiti. But a belief in revenants was common among the Romani and in Germany, France, Scandinavia, India, China, Indonesia, and Japan, as well as in Africa. In Central and Western Africa, where many slaves who were brought to Haiti were born, and South, Southern Africa, and in the Valley of Endless Sleep, somewhere in the Amazon rainforest. Dr. McDougall decided to continue with Part 2 of Phase 3, Bites on the Abdomen or Thorax. By this time, he had also read about the theories of a 19th century physician in Massachusetts who believed that the human soul weighed about three quarters of an ounce. His studies were dismissed as quackery, lacking any scientific merit because his findings were unreliable and non-replicable, and the germ of an idea was engendered in McDougall. So he ordered his assistant, Alice, or maybe her name was Allison, or Alyssa, to contact FPCM, the Facility Planning, Construction, and Management, and have them build a plexiglass room in the lab with state-of-the-art weight-measuring sensors built into the floor. Dr. McDougall would build his face for a protocol around this new instrument. Corporal DeBigny continued with the recruits' training. The ten, as she called them when she wasn't referring to them as intestinal worms, maggots, or isopods, she enjoyed invertebrate biology in school, were making visible progress as a team. Their weapon skills still needed work, but she was excited that she would teach them how to use a flamethrower today. She was fairly certain that she wouldn't have to use the halon extinguisher. 